Are you ready to have a little fun? Yeah. All right, here we go. I know I have a big formal introduction here for our next speakers, Dr. Uh, Jeff Carroll and Wild. And if you don't know who they are by now, it's your own problem. So I'm not going to read it. I'm going to invite them up. When I ask Ed and Jeff for their presentation, they speak every year since I've been at HDSA to close out our research forum. When I asked Ed and Jeff for a title last year, it was something like Get Behind the Bus, which we thought had to be a typo, so we switched it to Get on the Bus. And, and this year, we asked for a title of their presentation, and it's When is the Best Time to Plant a Tree? And I'm really intrigued to find out what the hell that means. So um, we're going <laughs> to welcome them up. Thanks, man. Hello, Hi. Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Baltimore. Good. Ready That's to your something hand. you can say. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's awesome to see so many people here. This is an amazing turnout and a fabulous convention. And we've been listening to some of the talks uh, today and previously, and they're all tough acts to follow. And I have to say that the science that's presented gets better and better each year. And this has been a super exciting year. So oh, I'm Ed. I'm the English one, the short one, and the funny one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jeff, which by default makes me the slightly taller and maybe marginally better looking one. <laughs> and we're both OK with that. <laughs> um, so. Uh, Oh, because we're kind of, we were really young when we started doing this, and now we're really old. And so now we have to do these uh, grown-up financial disclosure slides. It's serious stuff, though, because if the guy who grows the cherries tells you that cherries will cure Huntington's disease, maybe that's true, but you have to bear in mind that he's the guy who grows the cherries. So I think it's important to uh, request disclosures, financial disclosures from the people who are trying to uh, tell, tell you things and maybe get you to do stuff. So here are mine. I have undertaken paid consultancy work for Ionis and Roche and Shire Pharmaceuticals. All of the payments from that research uh, went to my employer, UCL, which kind of sucks, but there we go. <laughs> but it was to fund my HD research. Um, I am an investigator on two of the trials that we're going to be talking about, the Ionis Huntington Lowering Trial and the Legato HD trial. So Jeff is going to talk about those. But later on in the research, in the uh, clinical trials forum, I'm going to be talking uh, officially on behalf of the sponsor of the Ionis Huntington Lowering Trial. Um, I have no financial interest in the outcome of any trial or any of the research that I'm going to be presenting. And here is Jeff's disclosure. <laughs> to my great regret, I haven't grown up like that, and I have absolutely no financial disclosures to report. <laughs> if, if, please, God, you want to change this, just meet me later in the lobby. <laughs> I'll be taking donations. I'm, uh, actually, I'm a basic scientist, so I um, treat mice for a living, which um, is about as exciting as it sounds. Uh, and so I don't have any financial uh, disclosures to report. But he will pole dance for money. <laughs> later. That's later this evening. So I, as ever, we're going to give you an update about all of the cool <laughs> stuff that's happened in the past year. But a key theme of our talk today is the importance of context. So um, it's. Really, it's per perfectly fine to get excited about something, but it's also really important to know the context. <laughs> you really have to know the background to a thing <laughs> in order to understand the importance of the thing and the significance <laughs> of the thing. So we're going to tell you the exciting stuff, and then we're going to try and change the perspective and give you a big picture overview of where we've come from and where we're going. I'm really glad you're talking during that slide. <laughs> So yes, we will be talking about some hugely exciting things, but we all need to bear in mind that this is where we are now in terms of treatments that can slow down or prevent Huntington's disease or reverse the symptoms. We, you know, despite you know, several decades of research, we don't have any treatments that have been licensed that can do that yet. But that is what we're working on. And so we really need to figure out a way of getting from there to treatments. And, uh, you, you've probably, you may have seen this kind of slide before. It's the drug discovery pipeline. It's, it's, it's how pharmaceutical people think and science people think about how drugs are made. You, you start on the left with an idea, and on the right, drugs come out. And the thing about a pipeline is it flows in one direction. And I guess the idea is that patients have to sit at the end of this pipeline with a bucket waiting for the drugs to come out. It's one directional, and it's all very passive. And actually, we think that's not how 
HD research is, and it's certainly not how it should be. We think it's more like a tree. So that's why the word tree is in the title of our talk. Georgie, <laughs> there we go. Um, and just like a tree, uh, the HD research endeavor has various components. So at the base of this tree, of course, is its roots. Uh, it's got a trunk, it's got branches, it's got leaves. Uh, and we're going to start by talking about uh, the roots. And so for us, uh, the roots of this tree that are eventually going to lead uh, to the fruit of drugs for people with Huntington's disease is the global HD community. So I think all of us here are part of a really incredible network of organizations uh, founded and supported by patients and families, and this is the critical roots of the tree that are someday going to lead to the development of drugs. So there's an incredible amount of organizations, sometimes a bewildering amount of organizations, all of whom are working on their own little piece of the puzzle. So we have patient organizations like the HDSA, uh, clinical organizations like the Huntington Study Group. We've got uh, youth organizations like the HDSA's NYA uh, and the HDO camp. I'll say last summer I was at a camp put on by HDO here in Maryland, actually, and, and got to meet with some young people. I don't know if any of them are here. Uh, my very Make quiet fan club. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really amazing to watch these young people interact and get to understand about a really terrible part of their life, but in a really supported uh, and collegial environment, and make the connections that I know will support them and their own family's journey with Huntington's, but also help build those networks that will keep these networks that are so necessary going into the next generation. Uh, so it's on the basis of these uh, organizations that discoveries have been made, and starting with the most important discovery of, of all, which is, of course, the discovery of the gene which causes uh, every case of Huntington's disease. As Robert said, we know with great certainty if you have this mutation, you'll get the disease. If you don't have this mutation, you won't. Uh, and that, that knowledge came from the work of an incredible network of scientists, first of all. About, almost 60 scientists were named as authors on the incredible paper 93, which gave us all the answer to what's underlying HD. But an incredible amount of patient effort went into that as well. As many as 12,000 DNA samples were used. And when each of those people donated their DNA sample, they, did, they weren't thinking, or maybe they weren't thinking, this is going to help the scientists discover the gene. They just contributed because it was the right thing to do. And that, that sense that we're all in it together is an incredibly important basis. So we have this gene. It causes this mutation. We inherit this mutation from our parents, rather. And as Robert explained uh, in his one slide biology lesson, which is really all you need to know, our cells use D, uh, the instructions in DNA as a code to sort of build machines. And those machines are called proteins. So this picture here, this pink globular thing, just got published this, this year, I think, actually, just in the last few months. And it's the highest resolution picture I've ever seen of the Huntington protein, the actual little machine that's made that causes all of the symptoms of Huntington's disease. And so for a long time, we haven't known what the actual protein looks like. So just recently, we now uh, have a sort of a picture of public enemy number one. So, uh, and because of that direct connection between the gene and the protein, and everyone who has the gene gets the disease, everyone with the disease has the same basic mutation, that's why we feel it's reasonable to call Huntington's the most curable, incurable brain disease. It's not curable at the moment, but we're in this business because we believe that this is a fixable problem. And what's more, we know exactly what the problem is. It's that gene, it's that mutation, it's that protein. And as Robert alluded to, other diseases which may be more common, other brain diseases which may be more common, don't have that massive head start. So Alzheimer's, some, like one, less than 1% of people with Alzheimer's have a known genetic mutation. The vast majority, we have no idea what causes Alzheimer's disease in those people. We have no idea what causes the vast majority of cases of Parkinson's disease. But we know exactly what causes every case of Huntington's disease. And since 1993, for 22 years now, the best scientists around the world have been focusing with laser-like attention on that gene, that mutation, that protein, and the consequences of those in our brains. And uh, it's, a, it's an approach which has yielded huge progress, and we're going to talk about some of that today. So what's next after the roots is the trunk of the tree. 
So we think that the, that the observations that are made in people lead scientists to start uh, trying to understand the root causes of how this mutant protein kills cells and causes all the symptoms that we think of uh, as Huntington's disease. So there's a lot of things that we can do in the lab uh, that you may not see every day, right? Right now, in labs in Baltimore and around the world, scientists are working on Huntington's disease. And families and patients and, and people outside the scientific world might not realize that. And sometimes people might wonder, well, why are we doing this? Like, we don't really care about mice. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can do in the lab that would be impossible, unethical, or very hard to talk people into doing. So we can learn an awful lot. With the basis of knowing this gene matters to people, we can go back to the lab and use mice and cells and worms and slime molds, as Robert talked about, to make really fundamental discoveries of how that mutant protein causes the changes that lead to the brain cell death that we recognize as Huntington's disease. Scientists like uh, me can take, uh, take mutant gene, Huntington genes from people, which we know cause HD in every human that has HD, and put it in a mouse, and the mice get sick that in, in ways that somewhat resemble Huntington's disease. Uh, so a, a fundamental uh, discovery that was made that we've talked about earlier, but I think it's worth reiterating uh, over and over again, because I think its message is very hopeful. Uh, uh, scientists early on, when we first started making these HD mice, a group of scientists in New York uh, made a really special mouse using a lab trick that won't work in people, but it's a, it's a good example of the kind of things that we can learn from mice and why they're so powerful. So these scientists made a special version of an HD mouse. They took, an H, they took a, hunt, a mutant Huntington gene from a human that had HD and they put it in the mouse. And as we've described, that will make the mouse sick. But they did something in the lab which we can't do in people, which is they put in a special little sort of genetic hack that let them turn on and off the bad HD gene by putting a chemical in the mouse's food. So if they eat the chemical, the gene turns off. So you can, you can turn the gene off or on. So the mice were born with a mutant HD gene like every other kind of HD mouse we've made in the lab. They, they get a bit sick, they have some brain problems, they have some behavioral changes. And then the scientists in this, in this lab trick were able to flip off the expression of that gene, turn off the mutant Huntington gene. And you could say, well, maybe, maybe we could guess that the mice would sort of level out, right? Their symptoms would stop getting worse. Or maybe they would continue to get worse, but not quite so fast. But in fact, what happened is when we were able to turn off that mutant Huntington gene in the lab, the mice actually got a bit better. So this is mice. Nobody, I'm a mouse guy. I don't care about mice. But what I can learn from mice, I care about a lot. And what this tells me is that you can take a brain and get it sick with Huntington's disease, and to a certain extent, it can get better. It's possible to get better. And to me, that's an incredibly important advance, even if it's not obvious to the families at home. So that's just one example. That's one experiment that happened in the year 2000. But every day, in every lab across the world, right now in America and in other countries, people are working on Huntington's disease. There are uh, lab technicians annoyed that they are working at the weekend, but they are doing it anyway. And they are all focused on the same goal, uh, the, uh, that, which is brilliant. But the downside is that the main output of scientific research is these kind of academic papers in scientific journals written in language that the scientists themselves can almost not understand. So what hope for the rest of us, right? Uh, and it's a shame, because we know it's good. We know that science is good, and it's happening all the time. But if it's not reaching the ears and the brains of the people who want the treatments, then it can feel like nothing's happening at all. It's definitely not the case. But that's why we set up HD Buzz five, six years ago now, yes. which is basically to bridge that gap. So the scientists just do their stuff, they publish their papers, and what we do is we take those stories, we have a team of writers, and we translate it into plain language. I won't say plain English, because we actually translate it into 13 languages. And um, it's available online at hdbuzz.net, and we've actually just, pr uh, for the first time, produced these hard copy HD Buzz digests for people who's, for whom the internet may not be their natural habitat, should we say. Um, and uh, they're, they're available at our, at our HD Buzz table in the uh, exhibit area. Um, we, we can ship them to you or to your uh, support group or your clinic. Um, and you know, we're going to probably produce one every year or so of the, stuff that's, the cool stuff that's happened in the past year. But uh, the reason why we do this is because we, th two things. Firstly, it's good to give people hope. And not just big hope, but little regular injections of hope to keep you ticking over until the next big announcement. So, it, uh, you know, we, we like to give people small, important 
substantive things to hope for. But the other thing is that in the future, this is the stuff that will lead to clinical trials, drug trials, that you guys will be asked to take part in. And if the first time you hear about a drug is the day in clinic where you're asked to sign a consent form, that's, you know, something's gone wrong there. And that's why I think it's important to keep abreast of what's happening so that you can, uh, uh, when, when you're asked to take part in a trial, you can say, oh yeah, I know about this. This is the gene silencing stuff or whatever, or this is the KMO stuff that I've read about on HD Buzz. So that's why we do it. And it's kind of bringing the trunk of the tree, the basic science, to the people who need to hear about it. The, the branches of this tree, as we're envisioning it, is what we call observational clinical research. So all this means is anytime you go into a clinic to be studied as a member of an HD community, uh, but you're not participating in a drug trial. The kinds of studies scientists do, as Robert said, to make, to make precious observations in the people to whom uh, the disease matters. So observational research can involve things like brain imaging, uh, providing samples like blood or cerebral spinal fluid samples, doing cognitive testing. Um, and, uh, or donating samples. Here's Ed taking cerebral spinal fluid from a patient. I think this was on her Instagram. <laughs> uh, my, pa my patients are really cool. <laughs> so, uh, so in HD, we've got tons of these. I mean, we must have the more observational evidence on Huntington's patients than maybe any other uh, group in the world, thanks to studies like, uh, and give a shout if you are a participant in any of these studies. Uh, Predict HD. Yeah, thank you. Uh, cohort, uh, Pharos. Uh, track HD, uh, and finally, enroll HD. Give a cheer. So these observational studies are incredibly important. Some of them have kind of uh, wrapped up and are not recruiting anymore, like track HD. Uh, some of these observational studies have joined together to form this, this new study, enroll HD. And I, I would really encourage everyone, everyone uh, who's a member of the HD community is eligible to participate in Enroll HD. And we want to explain to you a little bit about the kinds of observations that are made in these uh, trials that lead to really important discoveries. So uh, two of the studies we just mentioned, a cohort and an effort of the European Huntington's Disease Network called Registry, uh, formed a, a, a team of researchers were formed to study the participants' DNA. And the consortium that they formed was called GEMHD. It involved many of the scientists who were involved in cloning the Huntington gene originally. And the study was focused on finding what's called genetic modifiers. So what is a genetic modifier? We know people, why people get Huntington's disease, because they have a mutation in their Huntington gene. And if we can go zoom in on that gene and count the CAGs, we can say, you'll get HD, you won't. But everybody here knows that within families and between families, some people tend to get Huntington's disease earlier than you would expect and some later. And most of that is due to their Huntington's mutation, but what, what other causes change this? Uh, we don't know for sure of any environmental things that change it, uh, but we've had hints for years that there might be, uh, it might run in families. So the idea was there may be a genetic component of why some people get HD earlier and some later. Something outside their Huntington gene that influenced this. And unbeknownst to the 5,000 people who donated their DNA for years and years to cohort and registry, because when they did it, technology didn't exist to do much with it, to be honest. But technology developed really fast. In my time in the lab, which hasn't been so many years, incredible technologies have been invented. Chips that let scientists read people's DNA at millions of bases. And basically, instead of saying, does this gene or that gene influence whether you get HD sooner or later, say, of all of your 25,000 genes or so, which of them influence your uh, uh, onset of HD? And that's what this GEM study did. It looked at every gene in the genome in almost 5,000 participants, some of whom had probably donated their DNA 15 years before, before the machines existed to do this analysis. And what the scientists found was four or five locations in the genome, areas of, of DNA where a particular variation was associated with having an earlier or a later onset of HD. So they found mutations that if you had variations, that if you had them, you would be expected to have onset of HD five years later than we would normally expect, five healthy years without HD because you had some genetic variation. And they asked the question, well, what are those areas of the, of the genome? What genes are living in those areas? And they found a surprising abundance of, D of genes whose job it is to help the cell repair DNA. So our cells are exposed to radiation and oxidative stress. We get mutations in every cell every day, and we have to get really good at fixing the DNA. And for some reason, don't yet understand, it seems clear that people who are better at fixing their DNA seem to live longer without symptoms of DNA, uh, of HD, excuse me. So this is a really, really important point. It's possible to delay the onset of HD in people. You don't have to believe me, there's data. There's human beings walking around that had onset late because they had this particular genetic variation. 
So now it's back to the lab, right? What is it about these genes? How do they influence the progression of HD? Right now, people are making mouse models and labs to dissect these things and understand them in detail so we can pass them off to people uh, like the CHDI Foundation to develop drugs to try to mimic that with a pill. And this is Robert's point. There's nothing more precious to a drug hunter than an observation made in the people you want to treat. And nature has done this experiment, right? This is an experiment that's been carried out by nature in the real world, in real people with Huntington's disease. And all that was necessary was for the technology and the samples to come together to help us make that observation. And now it goes back into the lab. The branches of the tree nourish the trunk of the tree. And what that yields is new drug targets. So as Jeff has said, we can make animal models. We can start working on drugs that mimic the effects of those mutations. So you're either born with those particular mutations or not that may protect or advance uh, the progression of Huntington's disease. But hopefully, some of those will be able to be uh, mimicked or replicated by a drug that we can develop or some other thing that we can do. Maybe it's stem cells. Maybe it's something else that we can do to mimic the effect of those mutations. So the effect is real. And now we just have to harness it. Um, but the information flows in both directions, and that's why we like the tree rather than the pipeline. So the people who took part in all of those observational studies are feeding information back to the lab, to drug targets to, drug targets to work on, but the information is also being fed upwards into the leaves of the tree, the, which is the clinical trials. So the reason that it's such an exciting time right now is in part because of all the clinical trials. But crucially, the reason that we are able to run and recruit and design clinical trials effectively for HD is largely on the back of all of the people who took part in all of these observational studies. So studies like Track HD and PREDICT helped us to figure out what brain scans we need to do, what blood tests we need to do, how, what thinking tests we need to do, and how many people we need to study for a particular drug, and how long we need to run the trial for, and start thinking about the problem of running trials before symptom onset, when you can look at people and nothing changes whether the drug is working or not. So how can we look inside the brains of those people? We will get those answers because people participated in those observational studies. And that work is not done. We still need people to volunteer for every and all observational trial. Because as we run the current generation of clinical trials of drugs, so we also need to plan the next generation of clinical trials, and we use the observational trial data to do that. So yes, drug trials are important, and you should all sign up for every drug trial that you can. But observational trials are no less important. And uh, it's, it's by signing up for those observational studies now that we will be instantly ready when we need to, so that we don't lose a day before we can celebrate the first effective treatments for Huntington's disease. And the one that we want to draw your particular attention to, because it's open for recruitment now, it's a great study, and uh, everyone in this room is probably eligible, is Enroll HD. Nice and I'm hat. putting the hat on largely so that I can have a drink of my delicious, nutritious coconut water. <laughs> I am not sponsored by the makers of coconut water. <laughs> um, but you if they want to, then you know my email's uh, <laughs> widely available. So Enroll HD. Everyone from an HD family is available. You do not have to have had a genetic test in order to take part in Enroll HD. And yes, it, it tells us about the biology of Huntington's disease. Because it studies so many people, it can reveal biological insights into HD that no other study will. And it's going to be the biggest study of HD that's ever been attempted. Crucially, it is also a platform. It is a database of people who may be eligible for future clinical trials. So the people who are going to be phoned up for the next cool clinical trial are the people who are already on the Enroll HD database. Make no mistake. Now, that, 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 there's not a one-to-one -one correlation. And sometimes people get into trials who are not in Enroll HD. But if you are in Enroll HD, you are doing everything you can to maximize your chance of being in those clinical trials. Because trials will tend to recruit people that we already know stuff about, like how old they are, what's their CAG repeat length, you know, what, how long is their HD mutation. Um, what gender are they? What other drugs do they take? What medications do they take? How's their blood pressure? Are they good at turning up for trial appointments? And that kind of stuff. The, the practical stuff that really does make a big difference. So um, I think it's a win-win. Uh, everyone should sign up for Enroll HD um, uh, if they can. Uh, but that does bring us to the leaves of the tree. 
So drug trials, the things I think that all of us as HD community members are most excited about, the trials to test therapies for Huntington's. So it's, I, I want to just take a moment and reflect on this as someone who's been in the HD community since about 2004. This is an incredible time. There are 13 trials that we could find currently happening for Huntington's disease. There, there's so many that I feel like I have a hard time keeping track of all the new trial announcements. And in many cases, uh, although not all, but many cases, these were drugs that were actually designed with Huntington's disease in mind. So uh, not just generally protective drugs, but drugs which might uh, actually target specific things that are wrong in HD. We think that th this uh, gives these drugs the best chance for success ever. Uh, and we're excited to talk about these, although we don't have time to talk about 13. So we just picked a few that we're particularly excited about. And we wanted to mention some highlights to you. Um, but the HD Insights publication, which comes from the Huntington Study Group, is uh, every issue, it comes out every quarter, I think, every issue contains a table of every HD trial that's either recruiting or uh, in progress. Um, and so that's a really, you can just Google HD Insights and it's a really good place to get a complete comprehensive list of every trial that's happening. And the other, the other resource that's super important here is HD Trial Finder, which is on the HDSA website. We'll come back to that. So the first trial that we're going to give you an update on, because something cool has happened, is the Amaryllis study. Um, Amaryllis, the uh, emblem of the global HD community, was the name given by Pfizer to their trial of a drug which is a PDE10, a phosphodiesterase 10 inhibitor. So um, this is an animation which will hopefully work of <laughs> how the human brain works. And basically, you probably know that the neurons, the thinking cells, use electricity to communicate, because the brain's a bit like a computer. But the, the, ele the little electrical brain cells are not connected electrically. They're connected with chemical connections. So the electricity reaches the end of the cell, but then a chemical signal has to jump across the gap called a synapse. And that's how the message spreads to the next cell. And that's kind of part of, of the way that brain cells make decisions. So what happens, to zoom in on the second cell that's receiving the signal, this messenger molecule or this transmission molecule enters the cell, and then it sets off a cascade of chemical reactions. And that tells the second cell that it needs to do something, and it's usually an electrical signal needs to be generated. After that's happened, and this is happening thousands of times every second in every brain cell in your body, unless you're Jeff. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what needs to happen after that is that, is that the, um, wow, that was unexpectedly bitchy. I, I, could just, I could just go sit down. Is that obviously the cleanup needs to happen and everything needs to be put back where it was so it can happen again and this happens in a flash. So the little Pac-Man guy is the PDE, the phosphodiesterase enzyme, scoops up all of this stuff that's lying around and helps us stick it back where it was so that the whole thing can start again. And the amaryllis drug, the PDE10 Pfizer drug, basically slows down the activity of those enzymes, which uh, evidence from um, studies in the lab, the trunk of the tree, has told us are behaving weirdly and probably overactive in HD, or that at least slowing down their behavior could improve the efficiency of signaling in the brain. And so the Amaryllis study um, was, uh, the drug is hopefully going to help with movement, and if we're lucky, it will also help with thinking skills, some of that brain fog that people with HD uh, will um, commonly experience. It's studying uh, early Huntington's disease, people with early uh, symptoms. Um, these people had uh, 10 visits. Each person was in for six months. Uh, and one cool thing about this trial is that the people who are in the trial, some of them will have received a placebo dose, a dummy pill, or a low dose, lower dose than the maximum of the active drug. So partly as a kind of thank you to the patients who took part and took that risk or that chance of getting a placebo, um, but also partly so that we can study the drug in its natural environment. This trial, um, Amaryllis, is rolling over into what they call an open label extension, which basically means that everyone who is in the trial, if they want to, gets to switch to taking a pill that is definitely the active drug and is definitely at the highest dose that was well tolerated during the trial. Um, and so that's a kind of a win-win for everyone because we get more information and it's a kind of thank you. So there, you know, the placebo is something that sometimes puts people off taking part in clinical trials. I don't want to spend a year of my life taking a sugar pill. Well, and we understand that it's scientifically necessary to do that, but this open label extension concept is one way that, the, that we can kind of pay it back and, and, and also get really useful information about the drug in, its, uh, in the real world. And the exciting thing about this is that since last year, this trial is now fully recruited and um, the trial is still ongoing and the open label extension is still ongoing, so we don't have results yet. Um, but the fact that it's continuing means that nothing went wrong.
Okay, so this drug isn't a calamity. <laughs> Yay! Um, but also, I think the main achievement here is we did a great job. We fully recruited this trial of a new drug that had never been tested in HD before, and now we, uh, we, you know, we just need to thank the people who took part and wait for the results. Mm. Another study uh, by uh, Israeli pharmaceutical company Teva Pharmaceuticals uh, uh, called Legato HD is studying whether a drug uh, called Laquinamod uh, could potentially help Huntington's. And so the idea here is um, the cells of the brain, as Ed said, uh, the ones we really care about saving in Huntington's disease are these neurons, these sort of uh, thinking cells, as Ed calls them. But there are other cells of the brain, uh, some of which, uh, particularly a type called microglia, uh, form a sort of immune system for the brain. They walk around, the, they, they walk through the brain and feel around and, and, and clear out dead cells and debris and, and anything that looks like an invader. And they might be hyperactive in HD. We have some imaging evidence from one of those observational studies that suggests that these microglia might be doing uh, too much immune system kind of stuff in the brain. And so the idea with liquinamod, this drug, is to kind of dampen them down a little bit and see if by chilling out the sort of brain's immune system, uh, we can make those thinking cells last longer or maybe function better. Uh, so the Legato HD study is still recruiting, so unlike the Amarillo study, uh, the Legato study is still recruiting, and you should be able to find information for, about this on HD Trial Finder, uh, which we'll give you a, a link to in a minute. And let's be clear, that's a drug, the, the aim of that drug is to slow the progression of Huntington's disease, so that's a drug for disease modification, mm -hmm. right? So if it works, it will help people to stay healthy for longer. The other um, study that Teva is running, and we've never lived in a world where one drug company let alone one as big as Teva, was running two clinical trials in HD, is a uh, study called Pride HD. And this is a study of a drug called Pridopidine. Now, Pridopidine is a drug for symptoms of HD, in, in particular, the movement symptoms of HD. And early evidence from two smaller trials earlier suggests that Pridopidine may be able to improve movement control in HD, not just to dampen down the unwanted career movements, but also to boost voluntary movement control. And if that works, it would be the first drug to do that. Uh, and it would be a really valuable addition to the repertoire of drugs that we can use to help improve the lives of people with HD. And once again, I have great news. The Pride HD study is fully recruited. It hasn't finished yet. The people who are in the trial have to go through the trial and then come out the other end. But we would expect an announcement for, of the top line results from that trial pretty soon, hopefully this year. The, the other study we wanted to mention, and one of particular interest to both of us, actually, uh, is what's called the gene silencing trial. So raise your hand if you've heard of this idea of gene silencing for Huntington's disease. Great. They heard about it this morning. Just want to make sure they were awake. They were all awake. <laughs> So this gene silencing study, sometimes called the Huntington Lowering Trial, this particular version that we're going to be talking about is often sometimes called the ASO trial. ASO stands for antisense oligonucleotide, uh, which is just a particular chemistry of this particular approach uh, to, to the more general problem of Huntington lowering. Uh, so this is the idea. Uh, it's, this trial is being run, the trial that we're going to talk about is being run by a company that used to be called ISIS. Uh, and for some reason, uh, <laughs> They decided to change their name to Ionis. <laughs> really weird. Uh, so just to be clear, uh, these people, not the bad ISIS. These are the really good ISIS. These are the ones that were very But they're supportive. not called ISIS anymore, oh, right. so we don't Ionis. have to say that. <laughs> they're the good Ionis now. Let's just hope that the terrorists don't change their name to Ionis. That would really, really suck, because it's custom of fortune to redesign the logo. They had to buy all new signs, and, and yeah, it's really awkward. So. Um, <laughs> In all seriousness, as someone who's personally worked with a lot of the folks at Ionis for a long time, just on basic mouse research, nothing to do with this current trial, these are fantastically committed scientists. And you know, sometimes I think as, as, as Huntington's family members, we think, oh, you know, like the scientists are sort of the pure noble. I mean, I like to think that as a scientist. And then the drug companies, it's like, oh, I don't know about them. But I mean, I, I've worked with these folks for a long time, and they're incredibly committed to Huntington's. They've kept this program going for a long time, and they've really seen it from the very basic lab work where I worked on it, uh, now all the way to the clinic, as we'll say. Uh, but w what is this general approach? What's the idea of Huntington lowering? So as you've heard a couple times, but just to reiterate, the so-called so central dogma of biology is this. We inherit our genes from our parents, uh, but those genes are mostly used uh, by our cells to make proteins, the machines that actually do all the work of our cells. The, uh, proteins aren't made directly using the DNA as a template. The, the instructions of the DNA are sort of carbon copied onto a, a, a copy that we call the message a single-stranded version of that same, uh, that same sequence. 
So uh, you, DNA, as you might have remember from sort of high school biology, is this double-stranded molecule of uh, repeating uh, nucleotides that, that, we can, that your cell reads as a sort of code. The, the drug that um, Ionis has made, which they're calling Ionis HTTRX, is actually a single-stranded version of DNA, a short little sequence of DNA that's been uh, extensively modified in the lab to make it get into cells right and do all the other things a, dr a drug has to do. So the idea with these, uh, with these ASOs, these uh, silencing drugs, is that they'll find their way into cells because Ionis has gotten really good at modifying them and making them able to do that. They'll find their partner, in this case, the message for the Huntington gene, and they'll stick to it specifically. So of the 24,000 genes with their own message and their own uh, uh, products in your cells, this drug will go in and just find the message for the Huntington gene. It causes uh, the cell to, to react to this, to this binding by, by destroying that message specifically and getting rid of it. And the thing about how cells work is if you don't have that message, you don't have the protein. And so from mouse experiments and from cell experiments, countless times I've done this myself in the lab, if you get rid of that message, you get rid of the Huntington protein. And as far as we know, having the actual Huntington mutation in your DNA is not a bad deal. It's having that protein in your cells that really makes them sick. So, that's the great news. The, the tricky part about this trial is these drugs are amazing, but they're not very amazing at getting into the brain. So getting drugs from the, from the uh, rest of your body uh, into the brain is really tricky. Uh, if you were to just take these drugs as a pill, your stomach acid would, would tear them up. And so because of that, uh, the approach that's being taken by Onus is these drugs are being directly injected uh, into the spinal fluid at the base of the spinal cord, uh, where they find themselves in the cerebral spinal fluid that bathes the brain, and it circulates. So by injecting it way down here, it finds its way uh, pretty rapidly all the way up to the front of your brain and, and basically fills the entire space of your brain. So uh, it's been over a, a decade, as I said, of, of lab research that led to this trial happening now. Um, it's designed, this is a very specific trial, it's only for Huntington's disease. Uh, it targets only the Huntington gene. Um, and Ionis uh, has done uh, a lot of work on uh, the uh, safety uh, and distribution and all those kinds of things of this drug, and Ed will have some more details about that later. But the bottom line here, the, the, the idea, the big concept I want you to leave with is that uh, when we take this into the lab and we give it to mice, remember we can take mice in the lab and we can give them these mutant HD genes and make them sick. In many, many lab experiments, when we take mice like that and give them this uh, an equivalent drug that shuts off that gene, uh, these mice not only level out, not only seem to stabilize their symptoms, in many cases the mice seem to do better. So I have very uh, solid hope it's still hope. We don't know the results of this trial. This is an experiment. As a scientist who spent a long time thinking about this, I have real substantial hope that we could improve people's symptoms if this drug does what it does in the lab. So the design of the study, uh, it's the first study that's happening right now is safety. The, only, the, the, the main focus of this first trial is safety. Do, uh, we don't want to make people worse. So a small number of very brave people are volunteering, 36 patients at sites in the UK, Canada, and Germany so far, a very small number of patients being recruited from each site. They receive active drug or dummy drug, placebo, as we talked about before, in this case, an empty injection, essentially, into the spinal fluid as opposed to the drug. Um, it's double blind, so neither the patients participating nor the doctors uh, have any idea what, what injection they're getting. The design is, is pretty simple. The patients are screened, and then they get four of these injections in their spinal fluid spread four weeks apart, and then they're monitored extensively. Remember, this is to see safety for four months to see did anything go wrong with these people that we didn't predict. Mice are not people, right? And what worked in the lab, we could have unexpected challenges, and that's what this trial is really designed to do. So this trial uh, it has started. So here's pictures of Dr. Blair Levitt at UBC in Vancouver and some guy named Ed Wilde from University College London. I should say, I, I'm not supposed to talk during this bit because <laughs> I'm involved in the trial, but I, I have to apologize for my terrible hair in this. It was, it was a, quite a stressful week. And uh, the person I was giving the drug to is, uh, I've known her for 10 years, and she's uh, like a, a good friend of mine by now. Uh, and I was about to inject her with something that might kill her. So my hair was really bad <laughs> because of that. Um, and uh, I, I promise to do better in future. <laughs> So I think it's worth just taking a second here because I know, I know there's, a, there's a temptation and there's a sort of fatigue that happens when you're in this community, right? Because you hear various things, you get excited about this and it doesn't work out. And I, I've experienced that too, I know. Sometimes things seem hopeful and they don't pan out. 
this is, we live in a different world. Since September of 2016, when these first drugs were administered, this, this, is, a, this is a turning point in the Huntington's disease community. We'll, thank you. <laughs> so, will, will these drugs work? I don't, no one knows. I don't know, no one knows. But there are people who have drugs in their brains right now that in mice and in monkeys and in every other way we know how to look will reduce the production of the mutant Huntington protein, which is the most targeted possible ap approach to Huntington's disease. There's no reason this won't work. And a lot of reasons to be hopeful that it will. So I think uh, there's another temptation here that I just I want to briefly mention because I know everyone wants to be in this trial, right? Everyone wants to be one of those 36 people because this is exciting. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Those 36 people are going forward in that kind of risky first safety trial for all of us, right? They're doing it on behalf of all of us because if it works for them, it will work for all of us. So we don't need to rush in and say, I have to be one of the 36. Those 36 people were chosen for very specific reasons by the clinicians that know them so they could run this trial as fast as possible so the next trial can get to more of us. So I think that we owe those 36 people, in particular, a round of applause on behalf of all of us. So there will be more about this. Um, I, we've deliberately held back some details, not because we like to screw with you guys, but um, <laughs> because there's stuff that I'm, I, as an HD buzz guy, I'm not allowed to say, but when I do the clinical trial showcase in what, an hour, uh, less than an hour, I am allowed to say. So stick around for that. Uh, there'll be updates on several clinical trials, and I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the Huntington lowering trial with some stuff that hasn't yet been said that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back to the, the tree, the research tree. We're, the leaves with the clinical trials, and if we're lucky, one or other of these trials or the next lot of trials will produce the fruit that we're looking for, which is effective treatments for Huntington's disease. And um, in wrapping up, I think what we want to do is reiterate that this is a tree that it is the responsibility of everyone in this room and everyone beyond in the whole global HD community to nurture. We all have a responsibility to look after every part of this tree, okay? So it's not just the clinical trials that need volunteers, it's the other stuff as well, it's the observational trials. And we all, the information will only flow in both directions if all parts of the tree are being looked after um, as effectively as possible. So on, the, on the clinical trials, um, it's actually much, like we've said, there are 13, and several of them are still recruiting, okay? You may not be able to be in the, in the first um, uh, Huntington lowering trial, but future Huntington lowering trials probably will involve the US. And it may not, it probably won't just be IONIS. There'll probably be other companies starting Huntington lowering trials as well. But right now, there are other, other trials that, that, that can make a big difference. And, you know, we, we, it's likely that we're going to need more than one drug, in all honesty. It, the Ionis drug may be brilliant. If we're really lucky, it will be absolutely great. But it's more likely, I think, that several drugs will be more helpful than one drug alone. And wouldn't it be great to have half a dozen drugs that we can tailor to each person? Each of those drugs needs to be tested. And the HDSA, with that in mind, has uh, created this HD trial finder uh, system. It's on the HDSA website. You put in a few very basic details about yourself, and it's all obviously completely confidential. And then it very quickly gives you a feedback. I mean, it's things like your zip code and your age and whether you had a genetic test. Um, and uh, very quickly, you get a list of clinical trials and projects that you can get involved in near to you with phone numbers, access to trial information, email addresses. So sitting here, not during our talk, but maybe during the break, <laughs> you could all do that now and produce a list and produce one for your brother, your sister, your mum, your niece, your nephew. Uh, everyone, I think, needs to know, at least know what trials they could be eligible for and maybe reach out to the teams and say, what would this involve? And let's see if we can make it work. And I'll, I'll just, I wanted to interject just for a second, sorry, I had to say that, um, uh, as many of you know, I'm an HD family member, and I think w one thing is sometimes we're preaching to the choir here, right? The people, the folks here are the self-selected group of the HD community, really a subgroup that's, that's engaged enough and animated enough to come to this meeting, which is fantastic. 
but by definition, you're related to people who aren't. <laughs> and if your family's anything like mine, there's folks that are not this plugged in. You guys are a really great tool, especially in the age of social media, to share things like a link to the Trial Finder website. And doctors like Ed aren't allowed to cold call your nephew who won't really talk about HD, right? But you can share this on Facebook and his kids might see it and might click on it and might be the next participant that fills the next trial. So please, <laughs> there you go. Please be a research wingman. Uh, and, and put this stuff out there on social media, and if you're positive and engaging, I think we can really get our families more involved. And I know Jeff means it in the nicest possible way when he says, you guys are a bunch of tools. <laughs> I don't think I said you that. You did. You said you're a really useful tool. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we know what he means. Um, so, uh, you know, even if you can't, I mean, clinical trials, let's be realistic, clinical trials are actually quite difficult to get into. Spe very specific age ranges, small numbers, generally a small number of sites. Other conditions, other medical conditions you have or meds that you may be on may prevent you from being in one of these trials. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't um, keep, uh, keep involved. And everyone, like I've said, at the very least, everyone can get enrol involved in Enroll HD. Um, it's enrollhd.org, and um, it, it, like we've said many, many times, you, you may get sick of hearing it, but we're never going to get sick of saying it. This is perhaps the most important tool for securing the future, the next generation of clinical trials, not only in terms of trial numbers, numbers of people eligible to participate, but also in terms of having the uh, resources and the, what we call the outcome measures, so the, the ways of measuring HD um, that we will need in order to run those trials um, effectively. Uh, you can stay engaged with the with the ongoing process of basic science research. You don't have to set up like you know a Google Scholar alert for every hu new Huntington's paper that's published, like uh, those of us working in the field do. Stay stay in touch rather by reading HD Buzz. Uh, you guys support it. Uh, you guys pay for it through the wonderful support the HCSA has provided over the years. It's it's there for you. We only exist for you. If something really exciting happens in science, you'll hear about it. We won't. You won't post every single story. You won't deluge you with an overwhelming number of uh, uh, stories. But the big news stories that really matter uh, for for future drug development, you'll see there. Oh, and the other thing that the, um, in terms of basic science, one uh, phenomenal initiative that you're all supporting by being supporters of the HDSA is the Human Biology Initiative. So this is basically taking your donation dollars to the HDSA and saying, what are the best projects, bi basic biology projects relevant to the human disease that we can support in order to uh, accelerate the um, development of treatments. So, you know, HDSA may not have the dollars of Roche Pharmaceuticals or someone like that, but what they can do is they can take that research funding, which is incredibly valuable, and direct it to a series of uh, carefully chosen, scientifically rigorous projects. So by supporting the HDSA, you're already supporting that, those incredibly important science projects. And I think the final point is about nourishing the roots of the tree which is the HD community. And uh, I think the best message is really be excellent to each other. Uh, and uh, people <laughs> as old as me will remember where this comes from. And you'll have to, I guess the young people can Google it or Bing it or <laughs> Veep it or whatever. Um, I think what this means is be aware that there is a community. Um, keep in touch with your family. Be supportive of them in their efforts to become more engaged. Uh, and uh, be excellent to each other. <laughs> Thank you. Which I think brings us to our final slide, oh. which is where we explain what the title of the talk is oh, and what it means. George so, would have never um, known if we'd skipped it. The title was The Best Time to Plant a Tree. And it comes from a Chinese proverb, which goes as follows. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time is today. So please go forth plant trees, look after each other, get involved, and let's do this together. Thank you. Questions? Thanks, guys. That was fantastic. We have time for a few questions. There should be some mics going around. If you have a question, anybody? One here. You want to yell it and we can yeah, repeat it? Yeah, absolutely yell. Um, there's been a lot of research uh, linked to the benefits of fasting, especially in HD patients. Can you speak to specifically to the benefit of uh, the DNA repair process uh, during the extended fasting periods? Do you want to repeat the question? 
question? Oh, so the question was about fasting, which, believe it or not, in lab animals anyway, is a really effective way of extending their lifespan, um, and about whether that could involve the DNA repair pathway that we talked about. As far as, I don't know of any published studies in HD patients about fasting. No, I think what we have is clinical experience in HD, mm -hmm. which is a bit special in, in the area of neurodegeneration, because in HD, I mean, in Alzheimer's disease, say, uh, people don't, there isn't a kind of metabolic syndrome that goes with that disease. In Huntington's disease, people need more calories to stay the same weight. And generally speaking, if people lose weight, so if, if, they, are pro, if they have a prolonged period where they're not getting enough calories, um, they, the symptoms tend to be a bit worse, actually. So um, it may be that in general, and certainly in experimental models, Fasting, particularly for short periods in a, in a kind of concerted way, can give a kind of metabolic boost and it can, it can uh, kind of be somewhat helpful in ways that we totally don't understand uh, for cellular function. In Huntington's disease, the cells are a little bit like, I don't know how many of you drive stick, as I believe you call it, or what we call a manual car, but it's a bit like you're driving on the highway, but the clutch pedal is kind of half pressed down. So you need to give more gas in order to obtain the same speed. And all of that kind of revving makes the energy kind of evaporate into the, into the air. In HD, it's a bit like that. And you, I'm sure many of you will know people who have lost weight um, around about the time the symptoms began or during the course of the disease. And we can actually kind of prevent that by topping up the calories or giving more in the way of protein, especially. Uh, and, and when people, uh, for instance, struggle to swallow in HD, their symptoms will often go crazy and the, and the movements will get worse and someone will just, just feel really miserable and sad. And, and uh, you know, if we can improve the nutrition perhaps by putting in a feeding tube in some cases, what we often see in the period after that is quite a dramatic settling down of, those, of that worsening. So I think the answer is there may be some benefits to fasting in some pattern. If anything, they may be, it may be more difficult to see that effect in HD because of the special situation which makes the cells a bit less efficient. But I think it's certainly an interesting idea and one that, uh, that, that it would be reasonably easy to study. Mm. Question down here? Yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago, we probably had three different pharmaceutical companies talking about gene silencing. Uh, and you, looking at them, you would have thought, geez, we would have a whole bunch of stuff in clinical trials right now. Are we having a problem with pharmaceutical silencing as things are getting closer to uh, uh, coming out? I think, uh, no, I think it's just hard. <laughs> and I think, I think it's worth reflecting, like, this is the first major brain disease that I know of that actually has a, on, a clinical trial for gene silencing happening. So I think Ionos has been really unwavering in their, in their sort of focus on this program. To run the kind of trials that we need to actually prove this work costs probably hundreds of millions of dollars off the top of my head. And that's where partners like Roche with big pockets and, and lots of experience in running those trials happens. And as far as I know, those partnerships have, have formed and been really substantial. Sometimes the programs just don't work. Um, there are other things that we didn't have time to talk about that are, er, that are earlier stage, so something called zinc finger nucleases, uh, which a company Sangamo and Shire are working on. So we, we kind of haven't talked about everything that's happening, and they're at different stages of development. And there are, there are newcomers as well. You, right. you probably heard the, uh, earlier, from earlier on about uh, the talk from the WAVE guys, who are a brand new entrant to the anti-sense oligo silencing field, who are taking a, a, an approach that involves uh, focusing on whether the molecule is left-handed or right-handed, believe it or not, which helps to improve, well, may help to improve the, the way the drug works. I think the point is it's a, it's a dynamic field. And drug companies, they are motivated by profit. Um, they, they also, because of that, and because of the corporate structures, they tend to have a very broad outlook that is motivated by getting results within three to five years, which is, you know, and the people at the pharmaceutical companies tend to move around and they get headhunted and they can move from one post to another. And so in the early 2000s, many drug companies, after being actually burned by failures in Alzheimer's disease, they basically said, we're spending a fortune, we're not getting the results we need, this, this field is not ready. We are shutting down our brain research programs. So Novartis and GSK both shut down big brain research programs. And of course, that affected Huntington's disease, even though we were going, hey, you guys, it's true about Alzheimer's, but look, we've got this gene, and we know what we're trying to do, and please stick around in Huntington's disease. And some of them did. Some of them did. But drug companies will always be, I mean, I suppose it's, it may not be fair to compare them to the eye of Sauron. <laughs> 
from uh, from the Lord of the Rings, but the point is that <laughs> they have this big roving eye. It's not lidless and wreathed in flame, but it's a big <laughs> eye, and it's constantly surveying the landscape, and it will focus with uh, a great energy on the thing that's most likely to bring the results that they want. And but if it's if it's not doing that, there are, the the focus can shift. So yeah, you're right. Some companies have left the field of silencing, but actually. Maybe five years ago there were three, and a couple of them have left. There's now about a dozen companies, a dozen drug companies that have an interest in HD lowering therapies one way or another. So I think as a field we're really, really healthy. PS, and I think PS Pharma, sorry, we really love you. I apologize do, yeah, on that. Yeah. I mean, Sauron was my favorite character from Lord of the Rings. Screw Frodo. <laughs> um, I think part of the problem is that that drug companies tend to be a bit opaque. They are kind of wreathed in uh, corporate um, secrecy and confidentiality. And that's, that's partly because if sometimes when a drug company says something, the share price tanks and thousands of people lose their jobs. And so it's, you know, they're very careful about what they say. And, and, and on the flip side, they don't want to say, promise stuff that they can't deliver or make commitments that, they, that their shareholders may not want to agree with. So you tend not to get too much information. But I think that we, uh, actually in HD, the companies have been pretty good at Keeping, uh, keeping us posted. Many companies will come to meetings like this uh, and they'll really engage with the community. And I think that's generally a sign that a company uh, is doing the right thing. It's a good question then. There's a question in the back. Thank you. Have you found other genes that are responsible for bringing age of onset earlier regardless of the CAG repeats? Yeah, I think, so that was the big excitement with this uh, GEM HD study. The, the kind of study specifically, if people want to know, is called a genome-wide association study, a GWAS. And what, the idea of that is to find, to be specific, regions of DNA that make people have an earlier or later onset. So this initial publication that just came out last summer described, like, DNA neighborhoods, but in those neighborhoods lives 10 or 15 different genes, and we don't know exactly yet which of those 10 or 15 genes is making it either uh, have earlier or later onset. But in that, in that one study, there were, I think, five different areas, mm -hmm. and some of them, the, the less common uh, variant was found to produce later onset of Huntington's, and in some of them, it was earlier onset. Now, that's not, not to say one gene is good and one gene is bad. It, you know, if we could produce a drug that reduced the effect of the gene that brought the onset earlier, that would also be a really good drug. So, um, yeah. Earlier onset and later onset in those kind of studies, it's it's both equally useful information when it comes to loading up um, the tree with new targets. I think it's worth pointing out here too that there's just it's sort of like oh there was a big paper and now silence science has gone silent. It hasn't. It's just you're not hearing about it. So I'll just tell you I know from that study there's I don't know 30 or 40 genes that look really exciting. There's people in labs I think in Boston making mice that lack or have extra copies of those genes and then putting them with HD mice and seeing what happens. Does their HD get earlier or later? That, and that will really let us untangle that. And those studies are actively happening right now for sure. So we'll know more. There's a question over, we got time for more? Oh, good to go. Don't be between people on lunch. Schedule, so, um, but, and Jeff, maybe we'll have a few minutes, they'll be around. Um, yep. But everyone, there's lunch outside. Um, please grab a box of lunch, there's drinks. Bring them back in, and at 12.15, we'll start hearing from the, uh, the HD Clinical Trial Showcase, okay? Thank you, Thank guys. you.